office last the year before this, one one year ago, we, we had these plans lined up, and for one month we couldn't communicate. Now when we came back from out from under it, we communicated again. As it happens, that coincides at a time when when the antennas are needed for the Jupiter mission. And we only have those antennas. And so that was the time we decided that since we're going to go through the solar conjunction, and since we need the antennas for the Jupiter, and since we'll run out of money, that's the appropriate time to shut it down. Steve wants to ask a question. Yeah, you had a uh, half, half promise that sometimes I answer a provocative newsman type question, so I'll ask in provocative form. I knew he was going to do this. <laughs> I, he doesn't know the answer, though. No, I know. This is, this is an honest question. All that you've shown us is really fascinating material. There's no doubt that everybody in the room has really liked the product. But as a chief scientist for NASA, how do you justify spending a billion dollars to go to Mars when there are all sorts of things you can spend the same money for on Earth and maybe get more practical human results from it? Yeah, would every one of you like to answer that question for me? <laughs> uh, I, want, I want to make sure you understand what he's asking. He's asking the toughest question that I get, and I get it routinely. I get it from congressmen, I get it from scientists, I get it from my colleagues. And it is, how do you justify spending a billion dollars for this when you could be curing cancer, you could be uh, uh, solving the problems of energy or something? The only sane answer to that has to be, we do it for the future. After all, Viking is, well, we get the results of Viking today. That's not the point. The point of Viking is to build knowledge. Mankind has tried to do this from the beginning of time. Madame Curie didn't do her work in order to, to give you uh, a, a knowledge of, radiate, of, of uh, uh, use of radiation. Uh, she was curious, that's all. Louis Pasteur didn't solve a why didn't he? he wasn't trying to build modern bacteriology. We're not doing this any more than any other scientist is doing this uh, for our generation. We're doing it for the next generation. That's what most of science is. If you look at society today, what you really find is the things that we use to keep the quality of our life and improve the quality of life came from ideas that are 50 years old. Modern electronics is based on not ideas that were invented yesterday. It, it use were, were found yesterday, but the Transist the concept of transistors is 20 years old. The concept of antibacterial slides are two decades old. You don't invent something the day after you discover it. Usually the, the, the time between discovery and its use is a few decades. I don't know where the data of Mars is going to be used, but somebody's going to need it. Some future generation is going to find the meteorological data or the seismological data or the composition vital to his modeling of the Earth. Someday the Earth, the, the global problems of the Earth are going to come to haunt us in a way that the knowledge we get not just from Mars, but, but from all of science. I don't separate Mars science or planetary science or space sciences from the rest of our science. We do science on the Earth in a broad, front way. We expand our knowledge without knowing quite where something is going to fit. We don't do it with idle curiosity, but we do it with the conviction that someday that piece of information is going to be vital to somebody, somebody's work. And the same answer goes for Mars and go for any, any other science. It's true you can't do it for less than a billion dollars. And that's why you don't do many of them. I mean, if you ask me, well, should we have 10 Vikings? I don't think the answer is yes. I think the answer is no. I think if I could take Viking money and cure cancer with it, of course I'd cure cancer with it. But that isn't the way it works, as you well know. If you take Vikings billion dollars and give it back to the treasury, we end up with one more flat top, or we end up with uh, an extra B1 or something like that. I mean, the kind of people who work on, on Viking don't solve cancer. I mean, they're aerospace engineers, and if they're not building Viking, they're building some kind of an arsenal. So I feel Viking is, in a sense, a good thing to do. But the fact is, that doesn't justify its existence. What justifies the Viking is the fact that this is a nation that can afford a certain number of things, a certain kind of science. One Viking, I think, it could afford. Two, I'm not sure it can afford. And I think the, 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 the kind of information you get from Viking, there's no other way of getting and someday, somebody's going to be looking at that saying, weren't they foresighted? Those are the guys back in the 70s that actually got a spacecraft from Mars and learned, I wish I knew what it was, I wanted to know, learned this particular <laughs> piece of information. I focus on that. Uh, we never know when we're doing basic research where that piece of information is going to be used. You know, well, well, some visionaries have that in mind. There are very few visionaries in the world who can imagine where that thing is going to be important. 
And uh, so my answer is to you is really, we do it for the future. We don't do it for our generation. We don't do it to cure cancer. We do it to solve some problem we can't even anticipate today. You know, today's problem we're working on. If we knew what tomorrow's problems were, we'd work on those. And the generation that we have after us, they're going to have a class of problems that are going to look up. Ours look simple. You know, they're, as Alvin Toffler has said it a dozen times, uh, they're going to be in the future shock. They're going to be the ones who, who inherit this, the energy problems, the global problems, the pollution problems that will make our things look, look uh, simple. And uh, the only hedge against the future is leaving a legacy of knowledge to cope with those problems. Let's take one or two more minutes. Considerations, all the rest of it. You just look technically at the way to go about things. There's no question the ideal way is to have things already out in space and launch things from there and avoid all the problems of contamination and gravity and so forth. Technically, no, practically it's a different story. Practically, to do that is first of all expensive, it's time consuming, it's hazardous, and, and so forth and so on. But I have no doubt at all that in the future that will happen. I just don't know when the future is. I mean, I, I'm serious about that. People have asked me, do I ever think there's going to be men on Mars? Of course there's going to be men on Mars, eventually. You know, I don't know when that is. It may be 100 years from now, maybe 200 years from now. But there's no question there will be men on Mars. And that just is the nature of man's, man's desires. He goes where he can go. And since Mars has an atmosphere and can live there, there's no question that men they will engineer the planet. They'll change it. There will be skyscrapers and valleys and operas on Mars. I have no doubt at all. Just it won't happen right away. And the whole concept. Shuttle is, in fact, the first little tiny baby step to sort of get some cheap transportation system out. Many people, many scientists, in fact, have attacked the shuttle. I happen to be a defender of shuttle for, for a funny reason. I mean, they attack shuttle because they say it takes all the money. You never get anything for science. Well, shuttle is, is a necessary step to doing what ultimately has to be done. And we're fortunate that somebody had the foresight to, to see that at one time. I think it will be vindicated. First, by its use on the Earth. I don't think it will have anything to do with space travel. I think the shuttle will first be used for communication satellites. I think that's what the age that we're living in. We're living in an age where communication is what everything is about. Not only the ability for us to communicate with each other, chief communication abroad, computer use, telephoning from Ames to Des Moines to the Ionosphere. I mean, that's, that's what communication is. And eventually, the Earth will be enshrouded with uh, enough satellites. So it makes far more sense to bounce something off a satellite down at Des Moines and just send it through a wire. We can get cut or eaten or, or eroded. And uh, the Earth will be enshrouded with communication satellites. That's the first vindication of shuttle. And it can really be used for that. And if we don't do it, the Japanese will do it. And they've already told you. <laughs> and if you talk about space science in Japan, they say, you know, it's all very interesting. You Americans keep doing space science. We want to own the communication satellites and rent them. And they see themselves as the, the IBM uh, of, of communication satellites. And they say, we're going we're to enshroud the Pacific in, uh, in communication satellites. We're going to rent them off to anybody so much an hour. And I believe it. I mean, that's, that's their kind of industry. That's what they're good at. And so I think the shuttle will, will be good cheap transportation when the flight comes, comes into pass. I think your suggestion that the shuttle will, in, in a sense, open the possibility for extensive space uh, exploration, it's certainly true. And you know, it's just not around the corner 10 years from now, maybe 20 years from now. But you know, what's 10 or 20 years in geological time? Uh, yes? Some of the work we did here had to do with uh, investigating the winds on Mars. And uh, we used the data from the uh, dust storm of 70, 
2002, I think it was. Uh, has there been a dust storm since the Vikings have been there and have numbers been indicated? <laughs> yep. Uh, Mars, is, one of the nice things about Mars, you know, and you ask, well, it's only about the practical aspects of this thing. You know, I, I, not being a meteorologist, I, I don't instantly feel comfortable with this thing. But the fact is, Mars is known because of its atmosphere to have extensive global dust storms every two years. It happens, it, it isn't tied, tied to, uh, to us, it's tied to when it's closest to the sun. Mars is, is not circuit around the sun, it's farthest distance, perihelion, and aphelion. And during those periods in which it gets close to the sun, perihelion, they have these extensive Martian global dust storms in which you virtually can't see the surface. Telescopic observations here, it's a completely uh, surfaceless feature. And uh, so we wanted to be there when one of those storms took place. And in fact, we were. It was a gorgeous opportunity to see Mars, not only visually, but with meteorological instruments, during this intensive global storm. And we, in fact, did go through that. Now, what was learned was that, first of all, the winds never hit the, the speed that people thought they would. They anticipated with their modeling that we would see s wind speeds of like 200 miles an hour. It never hit that. The highest number anybody hit was close to 50 miles an hour. Now, uh, yet that's enough to begin to move stuff out. I mean, what, what happens is saltation phenomena. The wind moves a large particle, which collides with a small particle and sends those up, and another small particle. And these particles start bouncing until they start pushing stuff out. Oh. The wind, the global dust storm we saw on Mars this time lasted about two months. And it was during those two months that pictures were very poor. Um, the beauty of that was it fed back into the modeling equation. We really began to correct some of the, the modeling that was done. And if you ask, well, what, what's modeling got to do with anything? The fact is we don't understand terrestrial meteorology at all. I mean, we're absolutely meteorologists. Are, well, I can tell you it's going to snow tomorrow or, or not. They really don't understand why. And the modeling is an attempt to understand the physics of the atmosphere. <coughs> Mars, in a sense, is much simpler than the Earth. The Earth is complicated by the oceans. Our oceans are, make everything so complicated in the atmosphere that trying to put it all together is very difficult. And uh, NCAR in Denver and Boulder has enormous computer programs trying to model the Earth's atmosphere. Hopefully, Mars is a simpler planet. It doesn't have these oceans and reacts more graciously with, gracefully with these uh, modeling experiments. And in fact, the, the data that, that he asked about is the data that's being used now to refine those modeling experiments. And hopefully, that might feed back into in the programs here on Earth. But you know, to answer your question, that was a contribution, and we, we, uh, uh, we're grateful that we went through. Should we take one last question? I was in for a latest question. Should we latest question all week? Okay, man's question, anybody's question. Uh, so you showed them the organic Okay, I'm going to read it. That's a good question to end up because it's, it's by far the most sophisticated aspect of this whole mission. It's, it's the one that can only be asked by a scientist, and, and I'll have to embellish the question in order for you to understand it. What, I made a dramatic statement that the biggest single surprise we had was the absence of organic because we expected to find it. I also made a statement, remember, saying that Mars was a highly oxidizing uh, state. And the question has been, is it this oxidizing state that has somehow burned up or or got rid of the organic material. That's an extremely interesting possibility, and one that many people think is, I happen to be one of them also, think is the explanation, that Mars somehow, first of all, is a very desiccated planet. It doesn't have water. We're used to a, to a planet that is saturated with water. Well, I said there's a lot of water on Mars. There's no liquid water. And in this very desiccated state, the chemistry is different. I think Mars, by the action of its radiation, has a very oxidizing condition. And if there is any organic there, or if any tries to form, they know, or if any comes in on a re meteorite, that it, it is very easily attacked by this superoxidizing condition. That's, that hypothesis just holds together. And I don't mean it's the truth, but it's something that fits all the, all the facts that we have. Now, you know, there's a danger in taking a theory and saying that looks good because it fits facts, and therefore it's so, because we're often wrong. 
But, but at least in this case, there's a consistency between the fact that there's an oxidizing uh, environment, that the radiation is coming in, that the planet is desiccated, that there's no organic. Um, that still doesn't prove whether there's life or not, but it explains at least the possibility of even, at least very low levels of organic material. Thank you very much, you've been gracious audience. <laughs>